I thank uh, uh, Chip Cochin team for inviting me to stand in front of all of you. Yeah, my talk is about utility, futility, and complications of MCS. And uh, we have been discussing since morning. We have so many questions, but very few answers. <clears throat> that is the situation as of now. But coming to the utility of uh, mechanical circulatory supports, as an interventional cardiologist, I'm more interested in a protected PCI and acute MI and with cardiogenic shock. But there are also situations which we face, like heart failure, cardiotomy, post-cardiotomy shock, and the cardiac graft failure after transplant, post-transplant RV failure, refractory arrhythmias, electro-EP ablations of VT, so and so. So <clears throat> I try to limit my talk to protected PCI and acute MI with cortisonic shock. And these are the devices which, has, which have been talked about. Um, uh, out of this, uh, the commonly available for us is VAECMO, IABP, and Impella. Again, in Impella, this 2.5 is going to be out of market. Only CP will be available probably from next year. That's what I understood in my last meeting with uh, Abeumet. And tandem heart is not available with us. So do we really need a protected PCI? Do we really need to use these devices in a PCI? See, as we are uh, doing more and more complex and high-risk patients, like this with uh, significant comorbidities, clinical comorbidities like post-cardiac surgery, advanced age, diabetes, renal failure, and uh, uh, obstructive lung disease. And many times we handle very complex anatomies, anatomies in these patients like left main bifurcation, calcifer lesions, diffuse disease, multivessel disease, and CTOs where we do retrograde. And also when you may need atherectomy devices and guide extensions in these patients. And especially when they're always poor, so those are the patients, you know, who are quite sick to handle. So in such patients, you know, we have some data. So we have randomized data as well as observational data. This is something which already Dr. Jabir has mentioned, uh, IABP in a high-risk PCIs, um, elective high-risk PCIs where it had not showed any uh, change in mortality at 30 days, but it definitely showed and it re reduced uh, hypotension episodes during procedure, which must have translated into a long-term benefit also in these patients. If you look at Alka's death at five years in these patients, it is much lesser in patients where procedure was done with uh, IABP support. And when you see PROTECT-2 trial, which compared IABP with Impella 2.5, uh, you can see uh, the curves were actually diverging from day three. So from day three, there is a difference in um, overall MACE rates. Uh, and overall MACE rates are quite low with Impella. And at the end of 90 days, MACE was 29% less with Impella when compared to IABP. You can see this is uh, at the end of 20 days, there is 47% reduction in MACE when compared to IABP, as well as 46% when uh, repeat revascularization is uh, removed. So that's a difference which was showed at 90 days in uh, these patients. And if you look at hypotensive events for patient, there is a 53% reduction in hypotensive events that makes you achieve complete revascularization and which is going to give you a good long-term outcome, which has been shown quite clearly in Restore Heart Failure Trial, where complete revascularization, in fact, improved uh, LV function uh, over one year. <clears throat> and this is some observational data which is also available, PROTECT-3, in which um, real-world patients are matched with PROTECT-2 uh, trial patients and one difference between PROTECT-2 and 3 is use of Impella CP in almost 68% of the patient. That, in fact, changed outcome significantly. It further reduced uh, uh, MACE rates uh, when compared to matched PROTECT-2 patients. And in PROTECT-3, longer lesions were treated, more longer lesions were treated, more calcified lesions were treated, and more left main lesions, 
and multivessel disease and more atherectomies were used. Despite that, outcomes, MACE rates were further low when compared to PROTECT2 trial. And if you look at complete revascularization in PROTECT3, so the residual syntax score was much lesser compared to PROTECT2 and also ischemia geopardy score was much lesser when compared to PROTECT2. That is mainly because of further reduction in hypotension episodes during procedure. So you can see it's almost 78% less when compared to uh, PROTECT2, uh, which is you know, statistically significant. So, so this is what PROTECT3 has shown. MACE rates at 90 was significantly down when compared to your PROTECT2 matched cohort. That is 15% again as you know 21% in two, and this is with IABP, which is 31%. And this is again uh, the trend uh, with the time. So the usage of IABP is coming down, as well as you know usage of percutaneous assisted devices are increasing in these subset of patients' uh, interventions. So this is another uh, national inpatient sample database. Uh, Again, a retrospective observational data, which also significantly uh, showed uh, MACE rates are quite low when percutaneous uh, uh, VAD is used, except for acute kidney injury, which has been observed, which had been observed a little more in these patients, uh, unlike uh, PROTECT3 uh, patients, where actually even incidence of renal failure was much lesser in patients where Impella has been used. This is U.S. Uh, Pella registry, which also showed uh, a significant difference between uh, PROTECT2 uh, matched cohort versus, you know, U.S. Pella. Again, in this, uh, the usage of uh, uh, CP was more. So where do we stand in terms of MCS for high-risk PCI? This is 2011 guideline, so which uh, kept it in class 2B in level of evidence. Uh, but in 2018 USC guidelines, it was not even mentioned. But despite that, you can see the uh, overall high-risk PCI is increasing, and also the usage of MCS is increasing in high-risk PCI. But having said that, I have to underscore the overall usage of these devices is only 11% of high-risk PCIs. So that is very, very important. I think this is one trial which would definitely pave path and also give a lot of clarity on uh, this protected PCI in future. So we have to wait for results. Keeping all this data aside, I would show a patient, a CKD patient, transplant was done, transplant is filed after 10 years, again came for a re renal transplant and had severe LV dysfunction, angio done elsewhere showed CTO of right coronary artery and diffuse LMCA disease and LCX disease. You can also see all OMs are occluded. And this patient, so renal team denied a transplant saying he has, his, his heart is not fit and heart team denied heart surgery saying his kidneys are not fit enough. So these are the scenarios where you know, we end up in using these devices to find a solution. So we used uh, <coughs> uh, Impella to uh, do a, a PCI, and you can see this is the result we have achieved. And three months later, we switched the patient to single antiplatelet, that is Echosprin, and then we did transplant. And now this patient is two years post-transplant doing fine. And this is another patient where uh, we had a discussion with patient, a patient anterior MI with moderate LV dysfunction, intermediate lesion in LED, and a total occlusion of right coronary artery. So we had a discussion for support device. Unfortunately, as patient is not affordable, we went ahead and we treated. So you can see what happened. So this is a very long RCS CTO. I needed retrograde. So we crossed to retrograde, and I externalized it. While I was externalizing retrograde wire, you can see what is happening to his pressure. His pressure is just dropped, and you can see what happens next. 
this is what happens so so your procedure may go in an unpredictable way once your procedure goes in an unpredictable way so from there so bringing back procedure onto track is much more difficult you can see we started doing cpr and as i was already um, uh, uh, already crossed retrograde so immediately we intubated did cpr but there was no mcs support uh, we externalized and we completed you know procedure because this patient is young so we could able to you know uh, sort this patient out and bring him out of procedure <coughs> So in AMI with cardiogenic shock, again, this is a different animal to tame. Uh, you can see uh, over a period of time, the mortality of this patient is uh, uh, coming down and our uh, survival is increasing, but still half of cardiogenic shock patients would uh, die, almost 50 to 60%. And one in five patients who got discharged would come back again within 30 days. So, can we make some change for these patients? Uh, I think we have still a lot of questions, but less answers. You can see this is a mortality, not much change in mortality in these patients. Uh, but, so when you look at these patients, when they start going into shock, it is a hemodynamic phase of shock, but once they evolve into it, they, it becomes a metabolic shock. So from compensated stage to progressive stage to irreversible stage. So if we can do something in early phase of shock, probably, you know, we can at least recover few patients. And you can see how vasopressors may not change uh, mortality in these patients. And as the number of vasopressors are increasing, you can see the mortality is also increasing significantly. And as it earlier, uh, talks mentioned early is better in cardiogenic shock and always uh, you know we should have a plan B that is exit strategy for these patients because few of the patients we may not be able to, uh, they may not be able to go to recovery you may have to bridge to transplant or LVAR device and if you see IABP in cardiogenic shock already Dr. Jabir has mentioned it has not shown significant mortality benefit. And if you see IABP in AMI cardiogenic shock, it's only a class 3B recommendation as of now, but it is definitely useful. We are using in patients with mitral insufficiency in ven and ventricular septal defect, uh, ventricular septal rupture where we have to uh, bridge a patient to surgery. And then uh, impella in cardiogenic shock with acute MI. So this is again, <coughs> A useful device, but we need, we, we need to uh, have randomized data to really show that it is uh, beneficial. We have single center data, we have registry data which showed it is useful, but till uh, now we don't have a randomized data you know, which can really uh, help. But this is one study which would definitely uh, show some light at, at the end of tunnel. Uh, which is, you know, a protective effect of early impella in patients with anterior MILV dysfunction, which can change uh, uh, myocardium's, uh, you know, functional uh, 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 way. So again, VA ECMO, uh, as earlier uh, uh, speakers mentions, mentioned, it increases uh, LV EGP and also increases LV oxygen demand. So that is one uh, flip side. But adding IABP to VA ECMO might benefit a little bit for these patients. And ECPLA is one more thing which also is quite useful in terms of uh, oral hospital survival, budget to recovery, weaning from MCS, as well as LVEF at weaning. So futility of MCS, I think this is something which uh, we all should understand where it is futile. So most important thing is peripheral arterial disease and also age, and you can see these parameters, when patient's parameters are like this, I think it is not a wise choice, you know, to use uh, MCS. And complications, the bleeding with impella is reducing as uh, our experience is increasing also, we are more and more comfortable with using 
you know, larger devices. And hemolysis in impella is seen in 78% of patients. And most important thing is check volume status, check inflow and outflow position with which you can sort out. If you cannot sort it out, I think you have to remove. Otherwise, patient may go into renal failure. And the common complication which creates problem is limb ischemia. These are the way outs for limb ischemia, I think, which um, uh, Dr. Gopal has shown in a VA ECMO. Similar techniques can be used even for impella. So protected PCI with impella assists for complete revascularization, changing outcomes beyond procedure. Case selection is key, although robust algorithms are not available right now to use. AMI with cardiogenic shock, a difficult subset for randomized trials. We, we all should recognize that. And AMI with cardiogenic shock, early decision on MCS with the proper case selection might help. When not to use MCS should be paid more attention. And post-procedure care to minimize complications is key to evolve into future. Thank you. Um, so it's important to recognize when to uh, use uh, MPLA and uh, ECMO. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, as they say, the trend has gone too far. Situations could be difficult to manage, uh, even if you use uh, MCS, uh, but too late. I did, sir. Thank you, Sharad, for a nice lecture. But you know, we sequentially looked over a seven-year period, 2001 to 2008, 2008 to 2015, and 15 to now 22. Well, there was a period of uh, COVID which disrupted a lot of the services. But what is interesting is the first seven years, there was more thrombolysis, less primary PCI, uh, late referral of patients, no systems at all, 85% got lysed. And our mortality in shock, which was 5% of the population, there's about 7,500 patients who had PCI. The first two publications are in Indian Heart Journal. The third is coming in. But what we found was that despite going more primary PCI, 85% getting intraortic balloon pump, shorter times to referral from secondary hospitals to tertiary hospitals, shorter door to balloon time, systems of care down, our mortality changed in the first two sessions over 120 patients from 54 to 52. Things didn't change. <laughs> And what we concluded, may, maybe your systems got better, but it was not really adequate. Still, eight hours were still referral times. Many of the patients had high lactates and stuff like that. Now, so I think the window, it's very clear that shock only improves with early reperfusion today. Whatever we have said about MCS or whatever has not improved mortality. It is only early reperfusion which is clearly improving mortality and reducing shock. So every attempt should be taken to early reperfusion. And that would be any type of reperfusion, in my opinion. And that is the single point I want to stress. And I'm just reviewing the last seven years' data, removing that one-year COVID time, and I'm getting the same mortality almost in another 120 patients. So clearly, we are not getting, we are getting better in everything, but unfortunately, the mortality is not changing. So how much was that? 40 percent, you said 40 or 42? 54 percent in the 54. first. 52% yeah, so in the second round. This third, I'll just tell you once we publish high. it, but it's not changing. It's half the patients still dying. I think for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest uh, patients, probably I think uh, VA ECMO is a good option. Yeah, Sharat, how do you, how do you purge the system? How do you purge the impeller system? Purging, purging. Yeah, yeah. How do you purge? So, impeller? Yeah. Your turn. So Dex dextrose water and heparin. Yeah. So there is a new trend that if you use sodium bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate, yeah, sodium bicarbonate instead of heparin, it reduces the complication of bleeding and heat. Yeah. 